and welcome to Hermetic Journeys. Yeah, this is the second of a three-part series of videos on alchemy, um, which of course is part of the larger series of videos on Adelana Fugins. Now we've taken this detour because um, I found that um, some of the underlying concepts in Adelana Fugins have to do with some of the alchemical processes. So we have to look at that so we can gain a better understanding of what Michael Meyer is trying to tell us. Now, before we get into all that stuff, I want to address something that a good friend of mine pointed out to me concerning the last video. I certainly talked quite a bit about the worldview of the alchemists from the 12th to the 17th centuries. And I did that because, as you'll see, that is a, uh, an underlying foundation as to what we're going to be discussing here. But what my good friend Pete pointed out to me was, hey, what is it that alchemists uh, are doing? Why are they doing this? You know, why would anyone go to such lengths, spend months in a laboratory to create the Philosopher's Stone? or months to create an elixir or a tincture or a spagyric with the plant in the plant world. Ultimately, alchemists were looking to cure disease. The, uh, uh, the Philosopher's Stone was hoped to be a universal panacea to eliminate all disease from mankind and to prolong life. Now, <laughs> the irony is not lost on me here. Okay, considering what's going on in our world today and what I'm talking about here and how this series of videos happened to fall in the midst of this. In terms of the plant world, um, and they, were, uh, they were creating elixirs, tinctures, and spagyrics, which we will discuss in detail coming up, uh, to uh, cure ailments, uh, to, to uh, enhance people's lives and their health. And that was the purpose of that. And of course, then there is the Philosopher's Stone component that uh, will turn common metals into gold. Uh, but I think the more important thing concerning that is the transformation within the alchemist. Um, the, the greater connection with spiritual principles, with a relationship with God, a relationship with nature. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring up one of my favorite etchings, of course, uh, from Heinrich Kunrat's um, Amphitheater of Eternal Wisdom, uh, the oratory in the laboratory, and we've seen this. And uh, as you can see in this in this etching, uh, Heinrich Kunrath is praying. So alchemists prayed before they went into the laboratory because they wanted enlightenment. They wanted to be closer to nature and God. So that's the first part of this video, and now we're going to take a look at the theory concerning spagyrics. And then the third part will be the mechanics behind it. And we're going to talk about some laboratory practices that uh, herbologists today use who are using alchemy in their practice. Uh, and of course, present day alchemists. And there are many of them uh, in the United States alone. All right. So without any further ado, uh, does that make sense? Without any further hesitation, let's get right to the theory of spagyrics. Okay, so here we are, uh, and we are going to discuss the theory of spagyrics. Well, before we discuss the theory, I have to introduce our mystery guest. He's been on our program before, Paracelsus, of course. And Paracelsus was a, uh, a brilliant uh, a man uh, who, uh, as we've talked, spoken about before, began to introduce medicines into the, uh, the world, uh, you know, to heal people. Instead of using the Galenic philosophy uh, with the, the, the humors, the four humors and the balance of the four humors, um, he uh, poo-pooed that and he got in all kinds of trouble for that because that was the accepted method of healing at the time. Um, and so uh, he suggested uh, working with uh, medicines uh, that uh, we would he would create in his uh, laboratory. So uh, we owe it all to Paracelsus. Well, not all of it, but <laughs> a good part of it, right? Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk big picture, and then we're going to go down to the nitty gritty. And the next, the next part of this video is going to really get into the nitty gritty. I'm going to show you an apparatus, a, a dis distillation apparatus, and we're going to go through the parts of it and how it works. Um, spagyrics is a Greek word that Paracelsus coined, meaning to 
take apart and to put back together. Now there's an alchemical term, a very famous one. Uh, it's a Latin uh, term, solve et coagula, uh, to separate and to coagulate, to separate something and bring it bring it back together. Now what does all this mean? I mean, what are we talking about, Frankenstein? No, we're not, okay. Um, what we're talking about is we're gonna take, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to the plan specifically, but this also applies to the, to the metals and the mineral work, as we'll see in the next video. So we're taking, let's say, a plant, and we're going to break that plant down. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna break it down to three components, and guess what they are? Mercury, sulfur, and salt. During this teardown, if you will, we are purifying these as well. So after we've purified, we've broken them down into the three basic components, the mercury, sulfur, and salt, okay, or the alcohol, the uh, essential oils, and the plant body itself, after everything's broken down, we recombine them. Now, when we recombine them, they become incredibly potent. So when we're talking about a spagyric, um, you only need to take a little bit of it because it's so concentrated and it's so pure. That's why spagyrics are very powerful medicines for people. Um, okay, so that's the big picture. That's the view from 60,000 feet. No, 30,000 feet, we can't go to, well, anyway. So, um, yeah, planes can't go to 60,000. Well, the SR-71, but that, that's okay. Anyway, all right, so that's kind of where we're, we're going from here. And now we're gonna take a look at the actual practice, the laboratory work of spagyrics, the work with plants. Okay, welcome back to the uh, alchemical, the practice of the, the spagyrics. We're going to actually uh, go into uh, some depth concerning what alchemists are doing in the laboratory when they create a spagyric. Now, before an alchemist steps in the laboratory, uh, remember when we looked at the worldview in the previous video, we found that there is uh, there are all these correlations, all right? So if there's one word I want you to remember through all of this, it's the word correspondence, right? Things correspond to one another. Remember, we have these planetary energies that, uh, that are uh, affiliated with certain internal organs in the human body and certain plants and certain metals correspondences, okay? So before the alchemist does anything in the laboratory, uh, uh, let's say I'm an alchemist, I'm gonna think, well, okay, so uh, what, what am I, what, what spagyric am I making and for what, what is its purpose? Okay, well, let's say with all that's going on these days, I wanna uh, create a spagyric for people with respiratory issues, okay? So uh, what I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, all right, now, which planetary, planetary energy or which planet is affiliated with the respiratory system. I'm gonna look in my trusty notebook, okay? And I'm gonna look and it's gonna say, oh, mercury is related to the lungs, okay? So I know that, all right, so mercury is related to the lungs. Now what plant falls under the planet mercury, falls under its auspices? And there are several plants. I'm just gonna pick one from the bunch. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna work with lavender. I'm just picking this randomly. I'm sure it may not be lavender, you know, although it's affiliated with mercury, that might be the right, that might not be the right plant to use for the lungs, but we're working with lavender. Now, of course, before I go out and I pick my plant, I have to decide what day am I gonna do this? Why? Because each day of the week is affiliated with one of the seven planets, okay? Remember, correspondences, everything is connected. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the days of the week and I'll mention the planets and, and which days they're affiliated with, okay? So uh, the sun, of course, obviously, Sunday. Uh, the, the moon, Monday or moon day. Uh, Mars, Tuesday. Mercury, Wednesday. So I know, oh, this Wednesday. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna pick my lavender and I'm gonna start my process on a Wednesday. Jupiter, Thursday. Venus, Friday. And Saturn, well, guess what? Saturn day, <laughs> okay. All right, so now I know that I need to work on a, on a Wednesday. I need to go pick some lavender, all right? I need to start my, start my process on a Wednesday as well. Okay, so what am I trying to do here? Well, I, what I need to do, I need to break down the plants, all right, into the three primary, primary constituents, which is a, a, a mercury, sulfur, and salt, okay? Now, the plants don't have mercury and sulfur in them, okay? But these are kind of symbolic. The metals do, okay, and that'll be in the next video, but we're talking about the plants now. So uh, 
So we're going to think uh, hypothetically here that the mercury represents, uh, remember, the spirit. So the spirit of the plant, okay, is actually the alcohol from the plant, right? And that's where the term spirits comes from when you go to the liquor store and they say wines and spirits. Okay, spirit actually came from the alchemical process because the plant dies and releases the alcohol during the fermentation process. It gives up the ghost. It gives up its spirit. Okay, so it can help us because right? nature is our teacher, okay? So then we also need to separate the sulfur of the plant would be the oils, the essential oil of the plant. Okay, each plant has an oil affiliated with it, right? And then we have the salt, which is the body of the plant, just the physical body of the plant. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get out our uh, distillation contraption, okay? We're going to fire it up, and we're going to uh, get us some essential oil, okay? So how do we do this? Okay, well, I'm going to show you that um, here, here is an, a distillation apparatus, which I'm going to, I've been looking at them. I'm going to get, probably going to get this one. Um, but anyway, I'm going to go through each part and explain what it does, and then we're going to look at the more spiritual aspect of it uh, next. So let's take a look at this device. First, we have at the very bottom, we've got, of course, a hot plate because we have to, we have to start the process through heat. Right above that, sitting on the hot plate is called the boiling flask. And in the boiling flask, we're going to take distilled water. We want this to be pure because what are we doing? We're purifying the plant, right? We're purifying everything. We're breaking it down and purifying it to its constituent components. So right above that, we have the reservoir flask, which is where the plant matter will be placed. So we're going to break the plant up. We're going to put it into the reservoir flask, and that's going to be cooked by the hot vapors from the distilled water below. Now, those hot vapors are going to travel up through that tube, sorry, that's above the uh, reservoir flask, and it's going to go into the distillation head, that tube that goes across and connects the two parts of the uh, distillation apparatus together. It's called the distillation head. It's going to travel up there and then connect it to the, on the other side of the dis distillation head is a condenser. Now, the condenser is interesting. It, it is a tube within a tube. The outer tube has cold water being circulated through it via a pump and two hoses, okay? When the hot vapors hit that, they cool down and they, they condense, right, to a liquid. And then at the very bottom there, we see the receiver, and the receiver is where the liquid is collected. And there's some runoff for the extra water because you're gonna have 98% water and 2% oil because uh, the, the plant doesn't generate that much oil, okay? So, on the more esoteric component here, as the vapors rise, the essential oil of the plant, along with the water in the plant, and the water, the distilled water, it's called a hydrosol. As that rises up into the distillation head, we can think of that as it ascending to the heavens. It'll be under the auspices of Mercury at that point, okay? The planetary energies will imbue it with even more power and more potency, okay? So that's why there's, there's a lot of symbology here with chemical apparatus. I know it's really bizarre, but hey, that's the way it is, okay? And then when it, when it goes down, when it goes down through the condensation, the, the, the condensation tube, um, all right, it goes back to Earth. So it starts on Earth. It's called the fixed or the, the earthbound, and it rises through the vapors, all right? And that's called the volatile or the spiritual, and it comes back down to Earth again. And we're going to run into that in Adelanto Fugians, that concept of the fixed to the volatile to the fixed. We're going to run into that in the, uh, further on in the stories. And now you know what I'm talking about when we discuss it, okay? Whew! Okay, so now, that, uh, so now we have our essential oil, okay? So now we have to get, sorry for using now 46 times, we have to, we have to get our alcohol. How do we do that? Well, the remnant of the plant, the, 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 the plant that's left in, 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 that, in the, uh, the reservoir flask, okay, is kind of like a mushy substance now because we've, we've cooked it, okay? We're going to take that out and we're going to put it into a new flask, okay? And we're going to add a little water, okay? We're going to cover that, not a flask, a jar, sorry, a jar. We're going to cover it and put it in a dark, warm place. And that is going to ferment, okay? It's going to give up the ghost, if you will, okay? It's going to die for us and release its spirit in the form of alcohol. So now we have the essential oil separated. We have the alcohol separated. Well, how do we get the salt? 
Well, whatever's left of the plant, the physical remains of the plant, we're going to take that and we're going to burn it. Burn, maybe burn. We're going to burn it, okay? That's called calcination. So we're, here are three processes, all right, that we're already encountering. The first one, of course, is distillation. The second one, fermentation. And the third one, calcination. We're burning that remnant of the plant until we get a white ash. And we have to burn it several times, right? You may have to bake it, and, you know, burn it and then bake it, all right? Then we're going to come, whatever we have left, that white ash, we're going to put in with some new, with some fresh distilled water in a new beaker, and we're going to let that evaporate, all right? Now, when that evaporates, you're left with this crystalline salt, okay? So now we have the oil from the distillation process, which represents the soul. We've got the alcohol through the fermentation process, which represents the spirit or mercury. And then we have the salt, which represents the body of the plant. So we're almost there. So we have these three components. Now, what most people do is they'll take the, the oil and the alcohol and they will further distill those. Because remember, we want to get this in its most purified form to make it the most potent medicine we can imagine, we can create, okay? So once those have been distilled again, we're going to recombine these, and that's called coabation. We're going to recombine these three elements, right, to create the spagyric. All right, now, because it's so concentrated, you, you don't drink the whole vial of spagyric. You're just going to take a little tiny bit of it and put it in some wine or something or your favorite drink, and you're going to drink it. And, and that's going to help people with respiratory ailments. Um, that will help them with their issues because, again, remember, <laughs> to recap, we're talking about the lungs are ruled by mercury. We're doing it on a, on a Wednesday, and we're using uh, an, an, an herb that's related to mercury that assist in uh, aiding people with, with respiratory ailments. And we've, we've taken this, this herb and we've, we've broken it down to its purest components and we've recombined them. So it becomes a really powerful spagyric. And that's what this is all about. That's, and again, I just, I just gave you one instance of one way to, to do this. And I think it's probably the, the simplest example in terms of you know the structure of the distilling apparatus and the results and everything. And uh, that, my friends, is how we create a spagyric, okay? That's one way to do it. There's lots of information out there. Um, the, there are several books I'm going to recommend when I actually uh, do a video on my sources, okay? Several excellent books on this, all right? All right, now on to the conclusion. I hope this all made sense, all right? I've worked really hard on this. <laughs> I hope it all made sense to you. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching. And I, I hope I've lit the candles here because I hope that you have been enlightened by what uh, we've just gone through because I have been enlightened through my intense studying of this material. And I, I love absolutely, I love every minute of it. Okay. So uh, anyway, um, before I say goodbye, I want to uh, bring up one thing. And that is, um, as I was doing this research, something struck me, um, uh, uh, not physically, <laughs> but uh, something struck me uh, uh, several years ago. I spent a month in Ecuador and it was a study abroad course uh, through uh, Arizona State University. And I spent time at a shamanic ceremony and, and I ended up speaking to one of the shamans there. And he told me, that the, uh, that the plants uh, are, are his teachers. Today, shaman are healers. Uh, what they do is if someone is sick in the village, they will create this brew. Uh, it's called ayahuasca. I'm sure you've heard of it, which translated means the vine of the soul. And they would make this brew and drink it. The plants would come alive in their world, in their realm, and they would tell the shaman what plants to use to heal this individual. Wow. Right. And so I saw this connection, this parallel between what the alchemists were doing from the 12th through the 17th centuries with spagyrics. OK, well, 15th spagyrics, uh, Paracelsus and those folks, what they were doing with spagyrics. And that was using the plant, the energies of the plants, the essential energies of the plants to heal people. So it's the same thing. Right. Uh, and, and, and funny, you know, the alchemist saying, uh, you know, nature is our 
is our teacher and we are students of nature. Well, that's exactly what the shaman was talking to me about in Ecuador, that the, the plants are their teachers. They learn to heal people from the plants. The plants tell them in their ayahuasca visions uh, what to, um, which plants to use to heal. Um, uh, one of the more famous uh, shamans uh, uh, from there, he's, I, th I believe he's now deceased, is uh, Pablo Amaringo. And the reason I bring him up is he painted his ayahuasca visions and they're absolutely stunning paintings. They're beautiful. Uh, and, and the ayahuasca visions are just beyond, <laughs> beyond imagination. Um, so <clears throat> I will uh, close with some of Pablo's beautiful artwork uh, and, and play a little music uh, uh, as, we, as we say goodbye. Uh, but I, I want to thank you all for watching. I hope this has been uh, an enriching and enlightening. I hope it's helped clear up some of the mis mystique concerning uh, the alchemical process. Uh, the next video, of course, will be on the minerals and the metals, which is going to be one hell of a video, okay? <laughs> because they're a lot more complicated and a lot more dangerous, okay? We'll talk about all that stuff, but incredibly fascinating. I, again, thank you for watching. I love this. I could do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thanks again and have a wonderful day and stay safe.